So I have presented on programming for 20 to 30 somethings in the past. Um, I am in charge of the Rails 20 to 30 somethings programming group, which if anybody here is a Rails member and interested, uh, you'll get my email at the end and we can add you to that group if you want. Um, so some of you may have seen me present before and it's been a little while. Um, when I first started doing 2030s programs like five, six years ago, it was still pretty new, especially to libraries in our area. So I did a lot of beginner stuff. And I feel like since then, libraries have started up programming, they've come on board, you know, they know the basics and now they're looking to expand. So what I wanted to bring you today were um, some new ideas for programming for 20 to 30 somethings. I have gone through here and edited it a little bit to make note of programs that you can do online. And we can talk about how you might do some of those because the whole landscape has changed in the last couple of weeks. And now you may not be able to do some of these in person, but hopefully you can plan for the future and do them then. So I broke it down in different categories. I'm gonna start with crafts and DIY. These I think are very popular across the board with all ages, but they've been very popular with the 20s and 30s also. Um, they like coming in and learning something and leaving with a completed project. What I like about craft programs especially is that it's a lot easier to talk to other people while you're also doing something with your hands, you know, you're working on a shared activity. And one of the primary goals of my 20s, 30s programs is to provide somewhere for people to meet each other, you know, form new relationships and learn something new at the same time. So a lot of people who come are single adults or they're new to the area. And it's really hard to find new friends as an adult outside of your workplace when you no longer have that structure of being in school. So you will get some college kids depending on where you are, but a lot of them stick to their own campus. So you're more likely to see people who are new to the area or didn't realize that you had 20s and 30s programs. They came as a teen and then they weren't interested in things for older adults. So they haven't used the library very much. So you'll likely get a lot of new people. So I like having the crafts for, um, to facilitate that easier conversation with them. So one of those programs that especially brings in new people is I was doing a series called Crafter Work. A lot of you are probably very familiar with the Crafter Noons. That's very popular with teens. So I wanted to try something similar because at my last library, we had space issues. So we were all using one meeting room. It was a little bit tricky. So I only had two dates a month that I could use the meeting room. So I needed to find something that I could do in a smaller room and be more flexible with. So I created the Crafter Work program. It was also, uh, it was on a Wednesday from 5.30 to 7. So it was drop-in hours, didn't take any registration. And basically I would use smaller projects that don't take very long so that if you did come in, you know, 20 minutes before the end of the program, you could still make something and finish it. And it was a great way to use leftover supplies. And I chose things that used, you know, common or leftover supplies so that I wouldn't have to worry about registration, that I could adjust whether, you know, I had one person there or 10 people there. We were in a smaller room, so there was a limit, but we never really reached it. And we would get a small turnout every time, but everybody who came was pretty much always new. It was their first time at my programming, for the majority of them, it was their first time in the library. So they liked the crafter work because it was drop in, it made it easier to come, you weren't committing to anything, and it was something small. And again, it kind of facilitated that conversation. And a lot of times that was conversation with me, and I would find out, you know, what do they do? What are they interested in? And I was able to talk up a lot of library resources that they did not know existed. So many of them ended up getting library cards or coming to future programs. And that alone was worth it to me to keep doing these programs. But I also just love crafts. So it was a lot of fun. A um, couple of the ones you see here, uh, we made a little cactus garden out of painted rocks. 
very easy to do. You just need some acrylic paints, which I think most libraries have on hand. The um, little potion bottle you see on the left there, or on the right, was actually left over from a Harry Potter program I did. And people really liked making the potions. So I did that as a separate event. And that one we actually did off site at a Starbucks in town because we wanted to try to reach people where they were. You know, maybe not everyone's coming to the library, but we wanted to have more of a presence in the community. So um, the other advantage to having smaller crafts that don't need a lot of supplies is that we were able to easily transport them to other locations. Um, this one I called Totes Creative, mostly because no one stopped me from doing that. So um, we were making custom tote bags. Uh, we used the Silhouette and the Cricut. Uh, my library at the time had both. So it's a great way to teach people how to use the vinyl cutter, how to get basic um, design experience. Uh, you will need to set up laptops for this. Maybe you have a makerspace. Um, we did ours just in our meeting room and set up the machines. Uh, it's a great way to show them how to use the equipment, which will hopefully get them to use things in the future. It's a good cross promotion of library services, but they get to leave with a finished product that is unique to them. You know, it's customizable. Uh, you can provide sample uh, designs, but most people kind of had an idea of their own. They found pictures online or they created something on their own and everybody's looked completely different, which was really great. Uh, and it's also just very green and it uh, supports checking out books from the library and you know, bringing your own bag, that kind of thing. So that was very popular. One thing I will mention is depending on the size of the bag or the design, some of these might take a while to cut. And with that, if you have people finishing at the same time, you might get a bit of a line, which I did run into um, because basically our cricket stopped working and I had to use just the silhouette. So it did slow things down. So depending on the number of machines you have available and the size of the bags you wanna go with, you might wanna limit that class to a smaller group so that people aren't waiting around as much. Uh, we were talking about finger knitting before the program started. Uh, I really enjoy finger knitting. It's very easy to learn because it's the same concept. Uh, once you get it, you just do that over and over and over until you have a finished product. So it's very easy to learn. Um, and it's a lot of practice because you're doing the same steps over and over. And I think that helps people to feel more confident in what they're doing. Uh, something I mentioned, I do this program with seniors also. I've done it with um, tweens, I've done it with teens, I've done it with 20s, 30s. Everyone who comes in, comes in is like, I don't know how to knit, I don't know how to do anything. You know, I'm not creative. I'm, I'm not sure why I'm here, it probably won't work. And by the time they leave, they're walking around showing staff, look what I made, and they're so proud of themselves. And I really enjoy seeing that, and I like, you know, providing that kind of service to the public. Uh, it's also very minimal supplies. There's no needles involved. Um, it's just, you know, the yarn. It's um, weight five or six. You can go lower than that, but it doesn't give you that same uh, rope feel. It gets uh, a little bit too tight, not as chunky. Um, so do 35 to 50 yards. Most of my classes that I do at other libraries, I measure this out and make little balls of yarn for individual people. You don't need to do that. You can find other ways to do it, have people measure their own, or everybody gets you know, a skein of yarn. Uh, this program you can do off site because you don't need any equipment. It's just the yarn and your fingers and maybe a pair of scissors for the end to cut off um, the extra after you knock things off. So it's very easy to do in different places. And you can do more than just the infinity scarf. I start with the infinity scarf because it is the same thing over and over. It's good practice. Um, and then I do some kind of like finger knitting 102 classes that are a little bit more complex. Um, you can make lots of different things, but starting with the basic 
you know, Infinity Scarf has been very successful for these. Um, a program that I have coming up, hopefully it's been rescheduled for summer, is Nailed It. It's based on the Netflix show of the same name. Basically, if you have not seen the show, um, the attendees attempt to recreate, you know, very beautiful cakes, cake pops, treats that are Pinterest level creations, but they don't have skill. They are not, you know, bakers or decorators. And generally they're very tight on time. So my plan is to provide, you know, cupcakes, whatever the base is, because my library does not have an oven that we can use to cook. So we're just gonna be handling the decorating portion or some no bake recipes. And they'll have to try to recreate them. Generally, you would want a you know, beautiful finished product in any other program. In this one, it's kind of like a bad art night, uh, which I've talked about in the past, but basically the worse it looks, the more fun it is. And a lot of the joy of this program is not creating you know, a masterpiece. It's about having fun with your friends, creating something silly and just playing. And at the end, you get to eat the results, which if you use a pre-made base, like I was talking about, uh, you're less likely to be food poisoned or something. Um, but on the show, part of that is that they make things and sometimes it doesn't always taste very good. So your, your mileage may vary there. Um, this is one of the programs that could possibly be changed to bring it online. This is what uh, I am planning on at the moment with one of my coworkers that you can have it a couple different ways. You can have the attendees compete over video chat, um, give them a list of ingredients ahead of time, give them a recipe. I personally opted not to do that because I don't know what materials somebody has at home. And at least until the library reopens, I don't have a way of providing those materials. So what we decided to do in the meantime is that myself and a couple of other staff members would all compete against each other. And the program would essentially be watching us embarrass ourselves, just like you'd be watching Nailed It on Netflix. So it's just kind of fun. It's a more social thing, but I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, one that I've done in the past is string art. This is a lot of fun, although it is very, very noisy. Uh, you do need some more equipment type supplies. Um, you need some wood and nails and hammers. It's definitely more hands-on. Basically, you're creating designs using nails that you kind of strategically place on the wood and you wind the different colored strings in between you can use basic embroidery thread for this. You can use weight one yarn, which is basically just string. There's lots of different options. Um, I've done this a couple times, and the most recent time we used the library's Carvey to make the designs on the board. We kind of made an outline, and it made it easier to place the nails in certain places, and it was great to show off the equipment we had and train people on how to use that. Um, a lot of people did opt to just make their own designs. Um, this person right here, she had her initials, but I do supply certain patterns that are printed out and they could put them on the board, they can trace them. A lot of people opted just to hammer the nails through the paper and then tear the paper away. That's another option. So you can do lots of different things, but it is hammering and nails and it was very loud, especially when we were using these folding tables because there was nothing underneath them. It kind of amplified the noise, but it was still fun and people walked away with something they could display in their home. Go ahead. Uh, cupcake decorating. It's just another great program you can eat, which having snacks works really well with teens. It works really well with the 20s and 30 somethings. Um, provide food and they will come. Uh, this was a great way to learn decorating tips like frosting techniques. We learned how to use fondant. Uh, we used a lots of different things. I partnered with our local community college 
um, at the College of DuPage, and they have a culinary arts program. And the, the professor came in, she had prepared cupcakes ahead of time. They were already made, but she provided people with recipes because again, we didn't have an oven and we didn't have enough time. Her students actually made the treats for us. They were very excited about that. So it was a good partner program between the library and the college where you know we can help them get some experience. Um, they can teach us. There was a student helper there as well. So uh, we brought in different kinds of frosting. We played around with the different tips, um, different ways to play around with it. Um, we did core out the cupcakes, so there's frosting inside, which was very interesting. Uh, and we tried a couple of other um, techniques and sweets beyond the frosting. So it was a lot of fun for people to learn. I did it around Valentine's Day. So we promoted it as make you know, a treat for your sweetie or make it for yourself, you're your own Valentine. Um, what was great is that in partnering with the college, uh, the professor was used to working with people with varying levels of ability. So we were able to bring in some of our um, wheelchair bound patrons, some of our um, developmentally disabled patrons, and they had a lot of fun with this. All right, go ahead. So next, um, I'm going to talk about nostalgia. There are a lot of programs you can do around nostalgia. They're very popular. Uh, especially with millennials because so I'm a millennial I fall very firmly in the middle of this 20 to 30 somethings and in the 90s and early 2000s technology changed so quickly and our lives changed so quickly and then you know the country changed around 2001 so there was a lot of change where we had you know an idyllic childhood where we were kind of the last generation to play outside without having all this technology around us all the time. And I think a lot of adults want to go back to that. It was an easier time. And in general, I find that all adults just really want an excuse to be kids again and have fun, but they feel like they can't be all the time. So giving them, uh, giving them a reason to do it, kind of telling them it's okay, uh, they really enjoy that. They have more fun. So one that, unfortunately, I was not able to do on my own because it happened when I was changing jobs. So I had to pass it off to somebody else. But we did an adult preschool, which was pretty much just come in, do all the things you enjoyed about preschool, about being a kid. Uh, I partnered with the um, children's librarian and some of our youth associates. They found some picture books that they thought adults might enjoy. They did a you know, story time reading of those. We had arts and crafts, games. They had um, some fun parachute things, which I think a lot of people really miss from uh, grade school. So they had some fun with that. There were just a lot of different things you could do, and it was a good cross-promotional program. Another benefit of this beyond just having fun and you know getting your hands dirty and playing is that in this age group you have a wide variety of people they could be in college they could be single starting a new job or they could be married with kids and for the people who had children this kind of taught them the skills that they could do these activities at home with their children so that was kind of a nice byproduct of this Um, so an open mic based on the Mortified podcast. If you're not familiar with the podcast, basically performers, participants, whatever you want to call them, share awkward stories from their youth. They might read old diary entries. They might bring pictures that they drew. Um, just tell embarrassing stories, your know, different memories they have. And it tells you about somebody, uh, what their life was like you know, how they present themselves to other people. But it's a lot of fun because you can kind of, we all relate to those awkward moments, especially if you're talking about middle school. So it's a good laugh. It's um, a way to open up. 
And you should be prepared to share some of your own stories because people might not step up to the microphone at first. But again, this is another way to break the ice um, with people who are you know, just meeting each other because you can go up there and talk about this story, essentially talking about yourself without having the awkward small talk dialogue. So that is an option. Um, you can do this over video chat, you know, have people come on Zoom and share their, um, you can have their video, see everybody on screen, take turns telling awkward stories or holding up items. You can also do this program off site. Um, I think it would be really good at a bar as long as you had a microphone. You could do it a lot of different places. Okay. Um, this one I'm looking forward to doing online very soon. I actually put it on my schedule as I was finishing this slide. Uh, it's a grown up show and tell. I've seen a lot of people posting. Um, there was a tweet going around a couple of weeks ago that seemed to be everywhere for a few days about we have cooler things as adults than we did when we were in second grade and we want to do show and tell we want to talk about our interests show off our collections uh, again it's easier to talk about because it's something you care very deeply about so you want to share that knowledge uh, you want to show off the interesting things you have and talk to people who might share your interests so uh, you can do this over video chat. You know, people can just show you what they have. They can talk about a specific topic they're really interested in. Um, you learn a lot of inter interesting things about people, but I feel like you can learn a lot about the items that they show off as well. Okay. Uh, this I've seen a few libraries doing recently, which is great. Um, it's cross-stitch. All kinds of needle crafts are very popular with this age group right now. Um, it could be embroidery, it could be knitting, crochet. Uh, we've been doing a lot of cross stitch at my library. It's kind of an ongoing thing. Once a month, there's a cross stitch program. Um, they were doing a program for a while called Not Your Grandmother's Cross Stitch. And we wanted to bring that to specifically the 20s and 30s. Um, one thing that is different from library to library but something I really pushed for is limiting the programs to the age group because it is hard to say no to the older adults who generally expect that all the programs for adults are for them because it's never been different. But limiting to this age group, I think, really helps and makes people feel more comfortable. And if you do allow those older adults in, when the 20s, 30s, which is the demographic you want, when they come in and see seniors, they think, oh, this program is not for me. This is not what I wanted. And they will leave and they won't come back. So we decided to do a separate cross-stitch program specifically for this age group. There are so many fun designs out there right now. This is an example of one that they did during the Not Your Grandmother's cross-stitch program. Um, there is a really nice design um, called um, Netflix and Stitch that I really want to do, and I might steal that for the program title. Um, I get my designs primarily from dailycrossstitch.com, and one of my coworkers creates a lot of designs as well. She has created an OK Boomer um, pattern for us to use the next program, which I think will really be of interest to some of these patrons. Um, if you are familiar with the term craftivism, it is using crafts for activism. So it could be a political leaning, it could be, you know, arguing for some kind of human's rights. Um, if you want to look into this, Shannon Downey is probably the best uh, resource for this. She is going on a tour this summer, or she was. I'm not sure what the status of that is at right now. Um, she's the person behind Rita's Quilt, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, we can talk about that afterwards. I can share resources. But this is a great way to tie in, uh, you know, activism, you know, maybe volunteering. And this is a program that you can do off-site. Um, that sounds kind of strange. For some people, this is something you would expect to do, you know, in a craft room. 
Um, but you can, we've been doing them monthly in a local bar. We've been doing it in Red Arrow. Uh, the only thing we really had to change is we had to buy some portable lights because the lighting in the bar was a little bit lower than we liked. So um, we have done that successfully off site and people really enjoy it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is the program that I have most wanted to do since I started programming. I really want to throw an unbirthday party. Um, I had it planned for uh, the summer, uh, which was going to be my five year anniversary at my last library for programming anyway. And then I changed jobs. So I still plan on doing this. Um, basically, it's all the things that you loved from, you know, childhood birthday parties. So you can do pin the tail and donkey. Um, you can play bingo, musical chairs, have a pinata or water balloons. You have to have a cake or cupcakes, some kind of sweets, maybe candy, um, give them party favors. You just have fun games. It's nice, wholesome fun. Uh, it's very enjoyable. And I think that's something that people really enjoyed about their childhoods and they look back on fondly and that they would like to experience again. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but one of my primary goals for the programs that I do is a social aspect because we have people who are new in town, don't know a lot of other people, they don't have the same connections. So a lot of them are looking for groups to hang out with, to do things. Um, there are all kinds of meetup groups for this kind of thing about like, I wanted to do that, but I didn't want to do it alone. So it's kind of a shared interest. Um, you don't want to do something alone, but you can do it. So I do a lot of social programs as well. So that is one of my major categories here. I can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, pub trivia has been very popular for us. Uh, it's popular with all ages of adults, actually. Um, it has, I feel like gotten bigger in the last few years that most bars you can find some kind of trivia program going on regularly. There are companies that will do it for you if you don't want to create the questions yourself. It's a great chance to partner with local businesses. Um, we do the cross stitch program at one bar in town. I have tried to do pub trivia at another so that we balance it out a little bit. Um, I've used bag of tricks before. I've used um, Teddy James trivia. I like them both. I've also created questions on my own. So there's a lot of variety there that you can work with depending on what your resources are, what your budget is. The themed trivia is very popular, uh, especially if you go for topics that are of interest to these age groups. Uh, you might look at 90s or 2000s pop culture, uh, music, Anything Harry Potter is successful with this age group. Um, I've done whole Harry Potter days with this group, uh, which I've talked about in previous presentations and a little bit at the beginning. Uh, Star Wars, Disney, Disney Con original movies, Parks and Rec, The Office. There are so many topics you could choose from here. And people like sharing those interests. They like meeting people who like the same things they do. And it's just a lot of fun. It's an excuse to go out. Um, hang out with your friends or meet new people. Um, I generally end up with one team uh, that's made up of individuals who came by themselves. Um, and traditionally that team has won about 90% of the time, which is very interesting to me. Um, so you can always do it without having pre-made teams. Okay, go ahead. Uh, wine or beer tastings, I feel like a lot of libraries have done or have thought about. Um, I try not to do everything in a bar, which is what I know some libraries have decided to do with their 20s, 30s programs, because it's not all about the alcohol. Not everybody um, drinks or is interested in that kind of environment. A lot of people are turning to the library for this kind of socialization because they don't want to spend all their time in bars but there is definitely an interest there as well. 
So you can do a wine or beer tasting. Again, it's a great opportunity to partner with local businesses. Um, I've done brewery tours, but I've also done a um, beer and pizza pairing program, which people really enjoyed. Uh, you can ask somebody from the winery or the brewery to explain their process. Maybe they can give you a behind the scenes tour, maybe they can't. Um, and they can do pairings with different kinds of foods or desserts, talk about the different elements, what makes one wine different from another. Um, obviously, this is something you can hold off site, which I think the majority of people have done to do it on site. Uh, your board has to approve things. You have to have you know, a liquor license. There are laws in Illinois that allow us to do this kind of thing, but the local laws may be a little bit more restrictive. So it is easier to do it off site. Um, you might also reach people who don't normally come into the library. So that is a benefit of doing this program as well. Go ahead. Retro game night is a lot of fun. Uh, this is kind of a combination of the social and nostalgia elements. Uh, it could be video games, it could be board games. You might try a mixture of both. Um, something I like to do is the Internet Archive has a large collection of classic DOS games that are available for free. And I will set up the program room with laptops and different tables, um, bring the home page up of this archive, and let people choose what games they want to play. We do kind of free play for a while. They get to find you know, their old favorites that they haven't played in years. They really love that. And then I would usually also throw in some kind of competition. Uh, we've done Oregon Trail, where we compete to see who can make it to the end with the fewest number of deaths and the most amount of money. Um, the last time I did this, we had someone just completely obliterate the rest of us. There was no contest there. She knew what she was doing. So it's a lot of fun. It's, you know, just something light and easy to do. Um, that you are each playing your own game on a computer, but there's still a social aspect of everybody playing in the room. So, uh, go ahead. Uh, we've got Treat Yourself, uh, which is from Parks and Recreation. It's, even if you haven't watched Parks and Rec, you probably are familiar with this um, term, holiday, with this gif, that basically it's a day to pamper yourself um, on the show, part of it is going out and buying things for yourself that you might not normally buy. Um, you can still use the same concept in the library that you can make bath bombs, essential oil rollers, exfoliating scrubs, you know, things to, you can make to pamper yourself. Um, basically, it's a self-care day that you can provide all kinds of things that are fun but are also really relaxing. Um, you can do nail art, either... Uh, providing the supplies for them that they may not be able to get at home, like the different stencils. Um, you can get little daughters. There's all kinds of tools out there if you start looking. Um, but maybe you just have some different nail polish and people, you know, give each other, um, they give each other manicures like you might at a middle school sleepover. Uh, you definitely have to have some kind of sweets or food. And you can also do it in February for Galentine's Day, which is another Parks and Rec um, holiday. It's generally uh, February 13th, but, you know, libraries have played around with that a little bit, moved it to different days as is necessary based on our schedules. And basically, it's a day to celebrate your female friends. So you could do things like playing rom-coms, you know, assuming you have the viewing rights. Um, or have waffles, because waffles is huge on Parks and Rec. Um, you don't have to be a fan of the TV show to enjoy these programs. It's just coming. It's some hands-on crafts. Uh, you can dress up for the occasion. It's an excuse to go out. Um, but it's a very low-stress environment as well. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I have a section for life skills and then a couple other different things in here. Uh, life skills or adulting programs are pretty popular for libraries to do. Sometimes they are successful, sometimes they are not. I feel like this is, after board games, this is the program that most libraries 
um, jump to first when they're starting out. And for some of these uh, adulting programs, people aren't interested as much because they figure they can learn things through a YouTube video or they just don't want to make the time in their day. They do work well with teens sometimes, um, but there are certain skills that you can do that make good programs and get high attendance. And go ahead. So the first one of those is buy your first home. I have done this program at least once a year uh, since 2015 and I always get a good turnout. Uh, it's good for this group because generally this is the first time they're looking into buying a home. It's a very stressful event. There are a lot of factors. It's a long process and it's nice to have somebody walk you through the steps of that. So I bring in a home inspector, a realtor, and a banker. Uh, when we did the first year, we did not have the banker there. And then so many of the questions were related to finances that we knew we had to bring one in for the next time. And then ever since, the three of them have worked together um, and they kind of walk you through the process step by step. So we start with the realtor. She talks about how you can find different places, how you make a list of what you want, what you need. Uh, she talks a little bit about figuring out your finances in order to find out what your budget is. And then the home inspector goes through and talks about what he does, why you might need a home inspector, uh, different things to look at while you're touring houses to know um, kind of what red flags there are. So that even if you are doing, you know, you're selling by owner, you're buying from somebody, you're not using a realtor or doing home inspection, there are still certain things you can see, like how to tell if the house has previously had a flood, even if the water isn't there at that moment. Um, there's lots of interesting things and it's, it's good household tips in general. So uh, he's very good at that. And then the banker comes in and talks about how to figure out how much money you have, how to get approved. Do you need a pre-approval letter? There's so much involved in buying a house. And I actually bought my condo, um, I think after the second year of this program. And I, it was very overwhelming and stressful, but I felt so much better having gone to this program. And the realtor also provided me with a couple of checklists and steps. Uh, I ended up using her as my realtor even, but it, it made me feel a lot better. Um, this program and most of the life skills programs, I don't limit by age. They kind of self-select, but we also had a couple of older patrons who had rented their whole lives or they had lived in another country and they wanted to know what the process was here. So we were able to offer that service to them as well. Uh, we also had a dad bring in his two teenage sons to learn how to get them out of the house as soon as possible. <laughs> so that was an interesting twist to the program. Um, this is something you can do online. Depending on how long I have to continue online programming, this will probably be one that I offer in early fall um, because I know I can count on presenters and I know that they can do it online because it's just a lecture. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the hardest group to bring in for the 20s, 30s, because again, it is a very large range. It's, it covers 20 years of the most changes in someone's life. The hardest group to bring in is that 18 to 24, your college age kids, because one, they don't know what you have. Um, they have a lot more going on in their life and they have a lot of resources on site if they're in college. Um, also, they tend to be working more part-time jobs, multiple jobs. They have to work nights and weekends. It's harder to get them in the library. Uh, something that I do for the college kids is a de-stress from tests. Uh, last year, I did a whole week of programs for this, that it was a variety of different things that some of the colleges do have lots of great programs during finals week. But if you're at a community college where a lot of the students commute and not necessarily going to be on campus, the library can kind of step in and fill that need for them. Um, so you can offer things like art therapy nights, which is one of my favorite programs to offer. Um, we can do adult coloring, Play-Doh, finger painting, you know, some great crafts, hands-on, but very relaxing. Uh, I play soothing music in the background. I generally just 
grab something off the new age shelf as long as it's instrumental. Um, I've also done programs where they make bath bombs, the essential oil rollers, same thing we talked about earlier. Um, and I've also just provided a quiet study hall for them in which a reference librarian is present at the program in order to help them with any questions they might have, help them find answers online. Uh, we also provided some kind of school basics. Uh, if you need an extra pencil, if you needed index cards or sticky notes, you know, things that you might need while you're studying for tests. Um, at my last library, we had a lot of commuter students. We were also across the street from a high school. So around finals time, the library was so packed that there was nowhere to sit for the people who wanted to study. So offering this extra quiet study hall where we set up uh, tables and chairs in the room kind of helped with that spacing situation. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yoga is a very popular program. You, know, you can go through the basics. It doesn't have to be anything you know, too intricate or advanced. Um, I wanted to make the program as inclusive as possible. I, I did bring in a speaker. She specializes in plus size yoga, which was a really big point for me because I wanted to show that anybody is welcome. It's about connecting with your body, about connecting with your breath. It's not necessarily the stereotypical, you know, very tiny person. I wanted anybody to come. She also uh, integrated some chair yoga. She talked about different ways to change the poses based on what your physical abilities are, what your range of motion is. So that was very nice. I wanted it to be inclusive to everybody. Uh, same thing, you play relaxing music in the background. Uh, if your library has yoga mats, if you do this program regularly, it's great to provide those. Uh, I ended up borrowing the yoga mats from another library because my library did not have them. And, you know, I had some good connections elsewhere that I knew they did them. Um, but the majority of the class actually brought their own, even the people who don't regularly go to yoga. It was something they always wanted to try. They wanted to learn about it. And this was a chance to do that without paying for the program, which can get very expensive. Um, and if you can't get an instructor, if you don't have that kind of budget, there are so many videos on YouTube. I personally like Yoga with Adrian. That's what I use in my own home because I'm not great about going to the gym. So I do it at home. You could do it at the library. And go ahead. Um, something that my group asked for at one point were some community service opportunities that we do these with the kids and the teens because they need a certain number of hours to graduate. And then after that, it's sometimes harder to find different opportunities, especially things that aren't ongoing or that might fit into the schedule of somebody who works, you know, more than one job, is working lots of nights and weekends, that kind of thing. So I've done community service days where we find different projects, have them available. People can come in and do them. Um, we had some people who had court ordered community service hours that they, um, joined us. I was able to sign off on, you know, one or two hours, depending on how long they were there. Um, we did fleece tie blankets, donated them to the local Project Linus in our area. You could give them to a shelter. Uh, for people or animals, if the option. Uh, we made paracord bracelets for Operation Gratitude. Um, that was nice. It was a good way to bring in men, actually, because they really wanted to support the troops. Um, so that was kind of a nice benefit there. Uh, you could also, you know, do something with food for food insecure people. You could do gardening outside, you know, make a community pantry. There's lots of different opportunities you can do here. It's just a nice way to give back to the community for people who want to help but don't necessarily know where to start. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my last one, true crime is so popular right now. I feel like it's especially popular with librarians, but that might just be people that I hang out with. Um, you can do a lot of different things on this topic. So your program could vary depending on what you want to do. Uh, you could listen to your favorite true crime podcast or just share uh, things as if it were a listener's advisory program. 
You could do a true crime book club. Uh, you could bring in lots of presenters who can talk about, you know, different true crime things throughout the country. Um, true crime for Chicago is extremely popular and we are very fortunate to have that around us. So you can do that. You can also just create a group where they take turns talking about their favorite murders um, or different experience they have, knowledge that they've gained. Because again, people build up this knowledge, they have a collection, a special interest, and they really want to share it. This is a way to bring out this very popular interest right now. Um, Naperville Public Library partnered with their local police and forensic specialists and did, I think they called it crime time, uh, to learn about how crimes are solved. So it was a great way to uh, partner with the community to talk about the actual real life things um, of the CSI, not just what you see on TV. So that was very interesting. Um, you could possibly do this as a video chat program. You can make it an online discussion group. There's a lot of flexibility here. This is not a specific program so much as a topic to focus on. So there's lots of different ways that you can work this out and you can do that over video if you need to, if you can't get into the building like we are now. Okay. So those are my program recommendations. So I can take questions now. Got a little bit of time still. So the first question is from Cindy Meadows who asks, how do you recommend marketing to this age group? Oh my gosh, I have so much um, <laughs> to talk about in this topic. Um, if, you, if you can see the next slide, my contact information is on there. I'm happy to send you the slides from my other presentation on that. But I have always been a every port in a storm kind of marketer. So there are lots of different ways because it is a very, um, there are lots of different types of people in this group. You will reach some by social media. I highly recommend using meetup.com. Uh, Facebook events are great also. Both of those work because it is people who are already looking for something to do. And if you have that one click registration, they are more likely to commit to it than if you ask them to go through a couple steps to get to the library's website. Um, I don't know if that, if we're just lazy or something, but if you find them where they are, that's very helpful. Um, I have put up posters in local coffee shops and businesses that has brought in some people. Um, I recommend having a specific e-newsletter for this group. And in that, you're going to want to have a slightly different tone. You don't want to use your um, official one voice marketing kind of approach. You want to be a lot more laid back, uh, you know, put in some memes and some jokes and pop culture references, you know, have fun with it. Uh, they really respond to that. A small tip that I had with that, which seemed to get me a lot more response, is I was using Library Aware. And with that, and I believe you can do the same thing on MailChimp, um, the email would say that it came from Jez at Elmhurst Public Library. Like I put my name on there instead of just the library. And people started responding to the emails because they knew there was an actual person there that they could talk to. Um, the same thing on Meetup, they would message me all the time because they recognized me as the organizer. So they felt that they knew somebody before they attended and that made them a lot more likely to attend. So if you have that personal aspect, you can do that. Um, I also had a bookmark with all of our programs on it. And when people came to the desk asking, you know, different questions, maybe it was about certain books that we were doing for our book club. I would give them that bookmark as well, and they might come to things, and I would give that to people at the programs to let them know what else is coming up. So those are just kind of my top tips, but I do have a lot of information on this. So uh, my website is jazzlayman.com. Feel free to reach out to me there. I'm happy to answer anything else. <laughs> um, other questions? Um, Isabel asks, what do you say to someone not in the 20s and 30s age group who shows up to a program? 
so I actually worked on putting together a script for this because when we first started the programs and made the decision, we knew this would happen and it did. Um, some of the key things that we hit were that we are trying to build a group for an underserved population. Uh, we're trying to provide a place for them to network with people in their age group. Um, and I always ended with, you know, if you are interested in this, let us know. I will pass it along to the adult services programmer. We may be able to offer this again for a larger audience. And usually with that, they were pretty satisfied. Um, I think very occasionally I would get a complaint, but mostly it was a learning curve with our marketing that once people recognized what we were doing, they would be like, oh, that's the Lib Social page. That's not for me. And then they would keep going with the rest of the newsletter and they stopped applying for those programs. But they would let us know when they were interested in a topic. And some of those I would offer multiple times. And with the like life skills lecture type programs where we weren't limited on space, I would open those up to larger groups as well. Uh, Kimberly would like to know, is it a must for the programmer to be in this age group or is a little older okay? Older is fine. I think as long as you work with your community, you ask them what they're interested in and what they enjoy, I think you can be of any age. I, you know, I wouldn't require somebody programming for seniors to be a senior. Um, I'm 30 and I do a lot of those programs. And same thing for kids. I think it applies as long as you are open to listening to your community and you pay attention to trends in the area. I don't think you need to be in the age group. Uh, Carrie would like to know, will you share this PowerPoint? I can share this PowerPoint. <laughs> Yeah, I will actually, I'll probably upload it to my website. I've got a couple of my presentations saved there. Great, and we will link to that from the uh, ILA webpage as well. Great. Okay, next question is from Melissa. Where did you say you got your, you got your cross-stitch designs from? Uh, it's called dailycrossstitch.com. It's actually a, they have a lot on their website that you can use. Um, keep an eye on the website because occasionally they will run deals where you can buy basically every pattern on the website for $10 and that access does not expire. So you can get all the ones after you buy that as well. Um, basically they will send you a free pattern every day in your email. Um, they have a general pattern for anybody and then they have like a members only pattern. But like I said, you can get that membership for forever for like $10. Uh, they're great as long as you're not reselling anything that you make with the patterns, you're welcome to use them. The next question is, do you have any advice for convincing a PR department that is resistant in marketing programs geared towards this group that these programs need publicity equal to our other patron age groups? Yes, this is definitely um, a topic that I have dealt with, that I've helped other libraries with. We're used to marketing in a certain way. And you know, generally that is a print newsletter. And I would not discount the print newsletter anyway. That actually does bring in, um, especially the 30 somethings for some reason. Um, so that does work. It's something that's sent directly to them. But generally I like to talk about reaching people where they are that you can put a program in the local newspaper and get you know some senior citizens but you're not going to get your 20 somethings because they're not looking there you want to reach them where you are and if you can uh, you can get some kind of statistics to back you up maybe with um, library card signups look at the ages you're bringing in it is an underserved group and with anything in the library we can have it available, but that doesn't really mean anything unless people know it exists. So a lot of that is going to be marketing this. And sometimes that might come down to you having to step up and do some of your own marketing. If the you know, traditional marketing group is not comfortable with the way that you need to do that. Um, I also think it helps to just to say like, well, let's try this for a while and see how it works. And then you can come back with some statistics. I'm big on numbers and spreadsheets. 
Um, so that's what I have done in the past. We've also put out surveys to the community and asked them to respond and tell us how they get their news. Where do you find out about events in your area? And I was able to bring that back and that's how I convinced them to get meetup.com, which has been very successful for us. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to, you have to give them reasons why you want to do something. And if you have a plan on how to do it, I think that makes people more comfortable as well. We have one more question from Becky. Have you tried to recruit any of your regulars from these programs for the Friends of the Library or Board? Um, I personally have not done that, but we have gotten people from this age group and who have occasionally come to programs have joined the board at my last library at least. Um, the library I'm at right now, we don't have a general friends program in the same way that other libraries do, so I don't have the opportunity anymore. But I think if you have people who regularly come, who use the library, um, people who go out and talk you up to other people in the community, people they know, I think it's worth giving them, you know, a brochure or talking to them that if you think you have a good candidate, just mention it to them because they may not know it's a possibility. I think those are all of our questions for now. Okay. Yeah, that's my contact information. You know, feel free to go to my website. You can email me through that or find me on Twitter. Um, I am right now, I have a newsletter that generally I use to promote for the, the presentations I do at other libraries, but right now I'm including a lot of information on how to move your programs online. So I hope to put out some more digital information soon if you are looking for that as well. Thank you for joining us today, Jez, and thank you for everyone who is with us. Um, I just want to remind you that next Friday's Reaching Forward Friday will be Experience Required, Building Supervisory Skills When You're Not a Manager. And that will be presented by Rachel Shulman from Vernon Area uh, Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a great weekend.